we're going to limit ourselves to 2D because um, it would be complicated for us to make the sketches of the cells and everything in 3D so you could follow, but um, these are general. So let me just say that, and we will look at some examples, that if the finite volume method is applied on a Cartesian grid, a perfectly structured rectangular grid with, where every angle is a right angle, then we recover the finite, differ the finite difference formulas. Finite difference formulas are recovered. This is quite interesting. We will look at an, some examples. But let's consider now a general grid, perhaps something like this. Okay, and the point here in the middle is our point IJ. And then, of course, the point here is going to be I plus 1, comma, J. This one is going to be I, comma, J plus 1. This one will be I, J, sorry, that one is minus 1 down here, and J plus 1 up here, and so on. Let's, let me write the last one. This is I minus 1, comma, J. And now the integral, let me give some names to this. To this um, so this is going to be our control volume for I, J. And I'm going to call this point A. This point B, C, and D. And so for the cell A, B, C, D, I can write the integral conservation law as DDT, and I'm going to use the indices IJ to indicate my quantities here. The Volume, ij, u, d, omega, plus integral on a, b, c, d of the flux. And the flux here, I can, uh, it's a, this is a, just a 2D, I can separate by components, and I'm going to write them as f, dy, minus g, dx. And then I have my source terms, Q, D, omega, and so F and G are the Cartesian components of the flux vector. Flux vector F vector here. So the surface vector for, for example, for side AB, for side AB, the surface vector <coughs> would be SAB, some delta Y between A and B times a unit vector in the X direction minus the delta x a and b times the unit vector in the um, <coughs> j direction or I can also write it as y, the, com the, the, the coordinate position of the point b, y b minus y a times unit vector i minus x 
b minus xa unit vector j. So i and j are the unit vectors in the x and y direction as usual. So now the final volume equation for um, the cell omega ij would be ddt so uij omega ij plus the sum over all the phases a b c d of f dy minus g dx equal to qij omega ij where the sum over ABCD covers the four sides of that quadrilateral that I have drawn, ABCD. So let's now consider a general quadrilateral and kind of find the formulas for the volume and things like that that we can use. So suppose that we have a general quadrilateral um, A, B, C, D, like that. And note the following, that if I draw the diagonals then um, I obtain a parallelogram built on these diagonals, which would be This parallelogram, let's call it one, two, three, four. Then you can see that the area, the, the area of um, the parallelogram is twice the area of my original cell ABCD because, of course, I have these triangles here, right? So um, the area. Omega, well, we're looking at area, we call it volume, but it's area because we're just limited to 2D in our discussion. The area of um, omega can be obtained from the vector product of the two diagonals. We see that the parallelogram one, two, three, four is has twice the area of the quadrilateral ABCD. So ABCD. So basically, the vector product between this diagonal and this diagonal gives me double the area. And I can get this diagonal by using the uh, vector difference between the location of point B and point D. I can get this diagonal by doing the vector difference between point A and point C. I do the cross product of those things and I get the area of the whole. 1, 2, 3, 4, divide by 2, and I got the area of omega. Okay? So we can write that. And I guess I wanted to do this in this space, but the area of ABCD is equal to 1 half. Of course, it's got to be positive, so let's just and these are the diagonals, the vector um, going from A to C, cross product of the vector going from B 
to D. Uh, uh, D? Yes, that's a D. So, this vector AB is equal to x vector of point B minus vector of point A and for any point this x is the position vector. So we have a formula for the volume based on the coordinates of the mesh points, which is what we can use in a computer program. We have xc minus xa. Um, this is just writing out the cross product. And we're taking the norm, of course. This is yd minus yb. And we have xd minus xb times yc minus ya or in shorthand we can write delta x between a and c delta y between b and d delta x between b and d delta y between a and c so you can see now that I can obtain for any shape over uh, quadrilateral ABCD, I could obtain my volume from this formula. Okay, so what else appears in the equation? We have the volume, and the next and the most important term that appears in the equations are the fluxes. So we now are going to concentrate on that, on that and actually the evaluation of the fluxes is the crucial feature that distinguishes a variety of schemes. So this evaluation of fluxes depends on, um, well, remember that we had different sorts of, of um, discretizations that we could use in the finite volume. We could use the cell-centered or the cell vertex, and that is going to affect also. Um, so it depends on the Uh, location of the flow variables with respect to the mess, mesh. And um, the selected scheme. So, for example, first one uses central scheme and cell center, finite volume method. And what we obtain um, is for a central scheme, remember that we have. For a cell-centered final volume method, all of the quantities are known at the center of the cell. But we need to evaluate the fluxes at the edge of the cell. So we need to find a way to, 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 to write down a formula for a quant the quantities at the edge. So this is where we use the central scheme. We approximate the fluxes. One possibility is to use the average of the fluxes. So, for example, if I write the flux term on the face AB, I can use the average between the points on either side of that cell face, which are the points, the flux at IJ, and the flux at I plus 1, comma J. So I look at the flux on either side, and the average, I consider it to be the flux on that face. Uh, where the notation that we use for the flux is that f i j 
simply equals the flux, which is a nonlinear function of u, evaluated at uij. That's one option. Another option is to use the flux, instead of the average of fluxes, the flux of the average of u. That's another option. And this would be F at AB equal to F evaluated at UIJ plus U I plus one comma J divided by two. So I average the flow variables first and then I use my nonlinear flux expression. Okay, so of course these two are not the same because in general f is a nonlinear function. So in general, could be linear, but in general is nonlinear. Then there's a third possibility that we could use. We could use the average of the fluxes in um, A and B. These points A and B, these no, are not mesh points, so I have to obtain them in some way. And what I'm saying here is F A B is equal to the average of F A plus F B. I don't have F A, so I have to calculate it in some way. For example, I can evaluate flow variables in A and B as So to have, um, sorry, uh, u in flow variables, I'm evaluating the flow variables, u at A, it's not a mesh point, A, so it's a self-centered scheme, so I could do, actually, I'm going to use four points, the four points around A, so it's one-fourth of uij plus u plus 1j, ui plus 1j, and ui plus 1j minus 1. And finally, ui j minus 1. So those are the four mesh points that contain flow variables around the point A, which is on the quadrilateral. This is an average of the flow variables that I can use to get fa, to put in this equation here. Or another option is to actually average the flux system saves, this is this, or average the fluxes. And if I do that, I would get FA equals to one-fourth um, FIJ plus FI plus one comma J plus FI plus one comma J minus one plus F i comma j plus one. So this one requires more flux evaluations. So it means because the flux is an earlier function, well, it's going to be more expensive computationally. So perhaps we won't, we don't want to uh, choose that one. Okay. So this is the central scheme and a cell-centered finite volume. So what if I have a central scheme and a cell vertex? Finite volume. So it's going to be look a little bit different. This is our second option B, central scheme. So in this case, we have a central scheme and a cell vertex. Finite volume method.
And so we can again use this average for the fluxes, either evaluating the flux at the average of the flow variables, uij plus ui plus 1, comma j, divided by 2, or fab equals 1 half of fa plus ab, sorry, fb is 2, the same, and this last one, corresponds to trapezoidal rule for the integral AB, integral over AB of FDY, which is one half FA plus FB multiplied by YB minus YA. And so summing the contributions of these integrals over the whole, um, so all the sides of ABC, ABCD, we would get integral a, B, C, D of flux dot ds is equal to, so we have um, two terms that are uh, f dy and then minus terms that are g dx, and so we'll have one half if you recall um, let's see, I think I need to draw my draw my little quadrilateral again. Um, it's A, B, C, D. And so we have F A minus F C. So basically, uh, you'd have to write all these out, um, write these expressions out for all of these four, and there's going to be some rearranging of terms that allows you to write this in a shorthand form. You have FB minus FD, delta Y. AC, and we have delta X dB plus G that shows you that you can actually get all of your flux terms for this um, just using the values and now this is not not so terrible because we can get all these values in the four vertices to calculate our flux, flux terms, and the other terms are just the difference between the coordinates, and these are actually mesh points. So we can, we can do that. You can imagine that this can be actually programmed now. So this is more easy to see if we apply a, a direct example, and to make it easy, we'll do an example with a Cartesian mesh in... Um, and for a Cartesian mesh, we'll see, well, let me, let me draw the Cartesian mesh first and show you. So we have a regular mesh here where this is A, B, C, and D. And for a Cartesian mesh where um, we apply, say, a central scheme You can see here that um, 
for i comma j here in the middle, then delta y a b would be equal to y at the midpoint over here above, which is i plus one half comma j j actual no j plus the point the point b is at j plus one half j plus one half minus y i plus one half this point here j minus one half and let's just call that delta y and uh, if we look at for example delta x a b that's well that's going to be zero because it's a Cartesian mesh so they're perfectly aligned then um, delta x b c is equal to well between b and c we just have delta x now we we can see we can write them all out the volume that's easy it's just delta x times delta y Um, delta B C B C B C okay there's the two on the same y level so delta y b c is equal to zero and so now it simplifies quite a bit and um, we can write the flux terms F A B equal to corresponds to the points um, I plus one half comma J so F A B is the value of F at X uh, sorry the X location of um, the midpoint ahead of I J so I plus one half and uh, I consider it constant all along this wall, all along this space here, and uh, equal to the point, to, 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 the, to the value here. So this is the flux. And so on for the other ones. I'm not going to write them all out. But we finally get DDT UIJ delta X delta Y is equal, oh, sorry, plus the flux terms. We have F I plus one half comma J minus F I minus one half comma J multiplied by delta Y so here are our flux terms, 1f delta y and 1g delta x, and the g values are gi comma j plus 1 half minus gi comma j minus 1 half, and this multiplied by delta x, equal to qij delta x delta y. So now we can divide by delta x and delta y and obtain duij dt plus f i plus one half comma j minus f i minus one half comma j divided by delta x plus g i j plus one half minus g i j minus one half divided by delta y equals to qij which is interesting because this looks identical like a central difference formula so basically we've done all of this you know discussion and um, painful uh, uh, derivations using the integral formula to finally get our central difference formula and this is why I was telling you that really the finite volume method 
shows its strength when we have when we have an unstructured or complicated mesh, but if we apply it to a Cartesian mesh, which is the same way using finite difference, we don't see any difference at all. We don't we don't see any any advantage of it. Okay? Um, so one thing that we can observe of this formula here is that if ij and gij do not appear explicitly in this formula, and so we have our even decoupling. And we know that this can produce some jagged solutions. So this shows what I've said in the beginning. Once you apply the finite volume formulas to a Cartesian mesh, to recover your central differences. They are compatible. But the great advantage of the finite volume method is that we don't re need to use it. It doesn't make sense to actually use them on Cartesian meshes because the whole point is that we can use them on any unstructured mesh. So uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to leave it here. And we're going to look at... Um, uh, Another choice next class that uses, instead of the central difference approach, the central scheme, it uses an upwind approach. And we won't go very far. All of this is just presenting the, uh, a, a general kind of idea of how the finite volume works, and we're going to finish it next class.